Mountain Mount of Olives. We're blessed you are with us online. Let's sing, let's worship this morning.
That's who he is. At this time, I encourage you to take a second, send a text, maybe a phone call, remind someone in our church family that you love them, that you miss them, that we are still together as one, as one body. Uh, let's do that now.
Hello, and welcome to Mount of Olives Church in Mission Viejo, California. My name is Nicole Sterling. I'm the Director of Student Ministries here at Mount of Olives Church. Well, we want to get to know you, and we want to know how you're doing. And we invite you to go online to our website and fill out an online communication card, letting us know you're watching the service today, but also how we can pray for you. This is also where you can go and sign up for our daily devotional emails. Well, Lent has begun this week with Ash Wednesday and continues for the next six weeks until Holy Week and Easter. And we at Mount of Olives, we want to invite you to take a, a step in growing your relationship with Jesus this season. And maybe that means joining a small group or daily spending time reading your Bible or maybe finding a way to volunteer and serve here in our community. And no matter what, we encourage you to let us know on your online communication card so we can help direct you and give you uh, advice for your next steps or just guide you. And so we just encourage you to do that this season. Well, we want to continue our service and let's worship the Lord together.
Well, we have now entered the Lenten season, and this is a time when we stop and reflect and repent and pray and grow in our discipleship. It's a time of reflection, and it's a time of of greater spiritual growth. And so I'm calling this new series, Walking with Jesus, as we walk with him to Holy Week and Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then on to Easter walking with Jesus, because that's what the early disciples did. They, they walked with Jesus. And, and it reminds me of one of my favorite stories about a young teenage young man who had gotten his driver's license and went to his father and said, Dad, when am I going to be allowed to drive the car? Come on, 
When can I drive the car? And his father said, son, I told you, you've got to get a haircut. Your hair is too long. It's all the way down to your shoulders. And until you get a haircut, you can't drive the car. And the son said, well, dad, I'll tell you what. You know, when we go to church, I see pictures of Jesus at church. And I've noticed that his hair is long, too. And, and the father said, you're right, son. Jesus' hair is long. But there's something else you'll notice about Jesus. He walked wherever he went. Well, that's true. He walked wherever he went. And the disciples walked with him from the Sea of Galilee in the north all the way down into Jerusalem in the south. And as they walk with him, they learn from him. They learn from him because they're not in a classroom listening to a lecture. They listen and they learn and they walk with him. They watch. They watch his reaction to the religious leaders. They watch his reaction to those who are broken and hurting and desperate. And so they're observing and listening and watching and they are learning. Now, one thing Jesus did not do, and I want to point this out. I think it's important in our time. Jesus did not teach the scriptures verse by verse. He just didn't do it. He didn't go verse by verse through the scriptures. And I know there are people today and pastors today who do that, and that's fine, but it, it doesn't mean that kind of preaching or teaching or Bible study is deeper. Jesus didn't go verse by verse. Instead, he, he told stories. He had themes. He taught people how to, how to think biblically, how to think theologically. And uh, that's what we try to do and what most pastors try to do. Uh, I think when you go verse by verse, it's almost like going to your history high school, your high school history class where you learn dates and places, but you never really learned the message and the meaning of the history you were learning. And so if we're really going to understand the Bible so that we can read it for ourselves, we need to understand its principles, its themes, its values, the threads that run through it. Uh, and, and to learn how to think theologically. So as the disciples walk with him, they listen, they learn, and they grow. Here's a great example from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 36. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching them in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This is what Jesus did. He walked into cities and towns and in uh, the highways and the byways and, and uh, in places that, where there were few people and places where there were a lot of people. And it says he had compassion for them. And, and in so many ways, this is the picture of a down-to-earth God this is the picture of God who comes to walk among us. He, he leaves the glory and the majesty of heaven, and he comes to walk in our midst. What a wonderful picture. What a wonderful image, how he comes to be among us. And he comes to be among all sorts of people. He comes and speaks with everyone. As a religious leader, it would have been understood for him to only speak to fellow religious leaders or, or only those who were considered highly moral in his time. But Jesus comes to all people. He doesn't want to leave anyone behind. We see an example of this earlier in Matthew chapter 9, in verses 9 to 13. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. Matthew was somebody that virtually everybody hated. He was a tax collector. And that meant in his time that he was collecting taxes for an occupying government, the Roman government. And so he was considered a traitor by many. He was also allowed by the Roman government to charge more than the tax that the people owed. That's how he got paid. And oftentimes the tax collectors would gouge the people. And so they, they felt that they were immoral. They were traitors and they were immoral. And so they called them sinners. And they said that they had to be far away from God. And yet, this is the kind of person, not only with whom Jesus associates, but this is the kind of person with whom Jesus is going to have as one of his followers. He calls him to come and follow me. And notice the response of Matthew. It says here, he just got up 
and he followed. No questions, no debates, no arguments. He just got up and followed. Now, you and I know far more about Jesus and his ministry and his mission than Matthew did. And yet, when Jesus calls us, how do we respond? Well, too often, the way we respond is with debating and questioning and and excuses. We're called to come and serve, and we don't have time. We're called to uh, be a part of a small group, and and, uh, it's an inconvenience. We're called to come on a Curcio weekend so that we can grow as a disciple, but we say we don't like the sleeping arrangements. In this Lenten season, it might be a good time to stop and to ask ourselves, how do I respond to the call of Jesus? When he asks me to do something, what is my response? Is it questions and hesitation and debate? Or is it a humble willingness to say, here, my Lord, send me? I think it would be good to grow in our response to the call of Christ in our lives, whether it be the call to serve or to grow or to pray more or to give more or to be involved in Christian community more. Wherever God is calling you, I want to encourage you to be like Matthew and get up and go. And then he follows Jesus. And it turns out we believe that he went to have dinner. uh, Jesus went to have dinner at Matthew's home. And now there are other tax collectors and sinners gathered there. And the religious leaders can't understand this at all. And that's where we pick up the story in in verse 10. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Jesus overhears their conversation. He overhears the question, why is he associating with sinners? And he uses the example of a doctor. He says, a doctor goes to deal with sick people. And so I'm like a doctor. I've come to to go to sick people. But we should never assume that Jesus' response is saying that the, the Pharisees were not sinners. He's not. He's just saying they think they're not. They are so sure of themselves that they think they're just fine. They have no need of a Messiah. They have no need of a Savior. But they do. They just don't know it yet. And for those who think they got it all together, and for those who think that uh, they don't need a Savior, they don't need a Messiah, that they're not a sinner, Jesus says, well, you're not ready for my message yet. It's hard for me to penetrate that kind of veneer. I've come, he says, to be be with those who, who know they need my forgiveness, who know they need my grace, who are desperate for my presence in their life. And that's why he concludes by saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Or he should say, I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but sinners. He's interested in mercy, not sacrifice. Not the sacrifice of religion and what we do, but he's interested in giving mercy to those who need mercy and grace. And then as we walk with Jesus, we turn to John chapter 3, and we read the story of a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious leader, in fact, one one of those very important ones in the Sanhedrin. And uh, he was a religious leader who who comes to Jesus with some questions. And we pick it up in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. So he comes to Jesus by night, probably because he is a prominent leader, and Jesus is somewhat controversial. He wants to be careful by the optics that are given off by this gathering. It could also mean that he wants some quality time with Jesus and wants to avoid the hustle and bustle of of the daytime. But he's got some questions. And he starts off by saying, Rabbi. He gives him respect. 
He says, we know you are a teacher come from God because of the signs and the miracles and the wonders that we see. He says, we know that you're a teacher. And what, what Nicodemus means by that is you're a teacher like maybe a college professor. You're, you're just a teacher. He doesn't realize that he is talking to the Messiah. You are a teacher. We, we've come to believe this. It's a corporate decision here. We've come to believe that you are a teacher who has come from God. But by that, he also means that you're a teacher who's been commissioned by God. And it never occurs to him that this could be the Messiah. This could be the Savior. And then he goes on. The story goes on. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. He says, very truly I tell you. When he says that, by the way, it means pay attention now. Really listen. I'm going to say something you really need to hear, something that's really important. And so he says to him, no one will be able to see the kingdom of God without being born from above. What does he mean? Jesus answered him, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. One of the themes of Jesus is the kingdom of God. Over and over again, he talks about the kingdom of God as being ushered in. The kingdom of God has come among you. He tells us parables, and they are stories, and they are stories about what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. It's a different place with different values than the world has. He even refers to it in the, in the Lord's Prayer when he says that we should pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's he talking about? He's saying that we should pray that the kingdom of God comes among us and is lived out in our midst. I'm reminded of, of the story of Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Lewis Carroll writes the, the great story and then a sequel called uh, Alice and the Looking Glass. And then Alice goes in the looking glass. She, she walks through into a mirror, into a home that's just like the one she lived in. But now everything's different in this home. Uh, everything is inside out and, and, uh, and, and, and not the same as her old house. And so if she wants to go left, she's got to go right. And if she wants to go right, she's got to go left. And when she reads the famous story or the famous par uh, uh, poem in the, in the story, uh, it's written backwards, and she has to use a mirror to be able to read it because everything is inside out in the looking glass. And in a way, that's what the kingdom of God is like. It's different what the, than the world's values. It's different than the, the world's philosophy. It's different than the, the world's priorities. It's inside out and upside down. Instead of having vengeance, we're told to have love and forgiveness Instead of having uh, uh, high criticism, we're, we're called to have high compassion. Instead of uh, living for ourselves, we're called to die to ourselves. Instead of living the, the values and the morals of the culture, we're, we're called to live according to the values and the morals of God's word. It's different. It's a different kind of a kingdom. And Jesus says you can't even see this kingdom unless you are born from above. You cannot understand this kingdom unless you are born from above. And being born from above means that the relationship we have with God is one from God to man, never man to God, born from above. That God is the one who creates this relationship. And being born from above means to have a, a new relationship with him, where the foundation of our being is Jesus. Like the Apostle Paul said last week, in him we live and move and have our being. That Jesus is not an addendum to our life, but that he is the foundation of our life. What Jesus is talking about here is, is not a new paint job, but a, a foundation being laid in Jesus Christ in our life. That he is the center of our existence. Not religion, but Jesus. And when that happens, we begin to see the kingdom of God. And then we pick up the story in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. And so Nicodemus has some questions. 
He says, how can somebody be born a second time? How, how can you be born when you have grown old? What he's really asking is this. Jesus, why do I have to start all over again? Why do I have to go back to the beginning? Why, what's wrong with the progress I've made to date? Because Jesus is saying, really, your foundation is wrong, Nicodemus. You've got to reconstruct the foundation. You do need to go back and start all over again. And then Jesus says that this can be done through water and the spirit. Water and the spirit. To what is he referring? Well, many people would say that this is a reference to the, to the water sack at birth. And so that, this, that describes physical birth and that the spirit is a, a reference to a spiritual birth maybe later on. But this is a very poor um, understanding of that text because that's not at all what Jesus is saying. And one of the reasons we know that is because he speaks of this as one action, one activity, water and the spirit at one time. In fact, what we really believe it means is holy baptism. Because holy baptism is more than just a symbolic act. It's more than an, uh, you know, a, a symbol of a, of, a, of a work being done inside. It, it is the work being done inside of our heart and our life. Water baptism is, is what Jesus asks us to do in the Great Commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's a different baptism than John's baptism. And then throughout the book of Acts, every time somebody becomes a believer in Jesus, they are baptized. It is the tool, the only tool in the book of Acts that is used. And so we believe that water in the spirit is a reference to holy baptism, which is a tool that God uses to bring us into relationship with him. And then he says, why are you surprised by this? He talks about the wind. He says, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Yes, it is true. The Holy Spirit is like the wind that blows. You know the sound of it, and you can see its activity, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. In other words, Jesus is saying the activity and the action and the work of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. And we don't always understand what it means. We don't always have clear understanding of all the functions. We just trust in faith knowing that the Holy Spirit is moving and active in our lives. And so Jesus is walking from the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem. His students aren't sitting in a classroom listening to lectures. They're walking with him growing as disciples, watching how he reacts, watching at how he deals with real-life circumstances and real-life situations. He's walking with them. I invite you to join Jesus and walk with him in this Lenten time. Spend more time in prayer. Spend more time reading the Gospel of John and grow as a disciple. And when he calls on you to follow him, whether it be in a small group or in serving, just get up and go. And so let's pray and ask him to help us as we walk with him in this Lenten season. Lord, we thank you that we have been called to walk with you, to be your disciples and to grow, to grow more deeply, more faithfully, not in religion, but in our relationship with you, that you might be the foundation of who we are, that we, like Paul, might say that in you, Jesus, we live and move and have our being. So do a new work in us in this Lenten season. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When you speak, darkness has to bow. Confusion has its final hour. When you speak, mountains rise and fall, it tears down every wall around me. When you speak, breathe upon the dust, you come alive in us. When you speak, you sigh.
silence every fear We feel your spirit here Around us Let there be
his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor
have been faithful Oh my life you have been so so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God 